welcome to the welcome to the last date of this gyan online one week course on social capital and health in india today we have two lectures lecture 11 and lecture 12 and then we will have the tutorials also and uh, it is really really very pleasing experience that we reached to this last day of online classes we have some evaluation work pending before us i have already suggested you all to submit your assignments in the google classroom some of you have already started uploading your assignments and time given for this is up to tomorrow 2 pm right so i hope you all remember that you have to upload your assignments in the google classroom by tomorrow 2 pm that is 19th february 2 pm right so now we come back to our original topic assigned for today's lecture and the topic is sanitation nutrition and safe drinking water advancement and limitations of public health in india so the larger perspective is public health in india and we will talk about the three important components within public health which are sanitation nutrition and safe drinking water we had a discussion on public health in global context and the lecture was delivered by professor nivako hisoda and now we will see this larger issue in indian context so this lecture is basically divided in five parts concept of public health then public health in india in sanitation nutrition and drinking water issues there are yes many issues and we will try to address all these issues briefly first of all just an idea about emergence of public health as a phenomenon at a global level primarily we can see this that public health as a concept emerged in united kingdom in 1850s basically because of the epidemics which has spread in uk in the aftermath of the industrial revolution and the rapid urbanization that uk had witnessed in 1840s and to address the problems caused because of that they started with the idea of of developing uh, an infrastructure for public health and ultimately there was a very important act that is known as the public health act of 1848 so the united kingdom's public health act of 1848 established a special public health ministry for england and wales it talked about many important things however four points i have identified here is improved drainage and provision of sewers the removal of all refuse from houses streets and roads the provision of clean drinking water the appointment of a medical officer for each town that means when england was witnessing the epidemic caused because of plague which had created uh, unprecedented mortalities over there then how to address that kind of problem there was a larger discourse building on that and responding to that basically this public health act of 1848 came then we see a similar kind of a development in us also in 1889 the public health service commission corps was established in the us right so in 1848 this was started in england and wales and in 1889 we can see a formal documentation on this in the us also as the systems scope grew it was renamed the public health service in 1912 the public health service act of 1944 consolidated and revised the previous laws that means there was a trajectory of growth of this public health department concept and infra infrastructure related to that now we come to 
the specific definition of public health because health community health public health private health and there are several other concepts related to health are already there so how do we define public health right so for this we will take support from the definition given by world health organization the expert committee of world health organization on public health administration has defined public health as the science and art of preventing disease the science and art of preventing disease prolonging life and promoting mental and physical health and efficiency through organized community efforts for the sanitation of the environment the control of communicable infection the education of the individuals personal hygiene the organization of medical and nursing services for early diagnosis and preventive treatment of disease <coughs> the development of the social machinery to ensure to every individual a standard of living adequate for the maintenance of health and so organizing these benefits as to enable every citizen to realize to realize his birth right of health and longevity this is a very comprehensive definition and as you may see very, very long one also but uh, this definition in itself is self explanatory everything has been included in this definition however i would like to highlight only two three points over here this is the science and art of so basically it is not keeping itself confined to science only or medical science only it goes beyond that because it's related to our life day to day life community life social life political economic life right every possible dimension of life and that is why it is not remaining confined to the domain of medical science or science but it includes the science and art of preventing disease prolonging life promoting mental and physical health and efficiency right all these are the goals of this then what kind of channels it can use organized community efforts right that is again the important parameter here organized community efforts so what is the difference between personal health and public health that personal health basically individuals are responsible in their personal capacity and in public health basically it will be the responsibility of the community right means the sometimes that may act at the level of the community sometimes it may act at the level of the society or the state so that is how public health is basically defined and then which components basically it takes into consideration sanitation of the environment control of communicable infection education of the individuals personal hygiene organization of the medical and nursing services and all other related aspects i hope you got an idea about what public health is who always focus on a very comprehensive approach its definition of health includes multiple dimensions like physical mental social spiritual and also dimensions related to occupation so world health organization defines health in a very comprehensive way and just like that also defines public health in a very comprehensive way now there is a trajectory of growth of this public health globally world over and there are three important milestones milestones that we can identify the almarta declaration of 1978 right world health organization basically had a, uh, its own convention and in 1978 it made a declaration that health for all by 2000 that is by the turn of the millennium right so that is very important goal and then in 2000 we had the millennium development goal mdgs which will remain effective up to 2015 and in 2015 we had this sustainable development goals that means you can see a continuity right the, so who world health organization talks about health talks about public health then makes a goal of health for all and then gives further specific goals during the mdg and sdgs so this is the trajectory of growth of public health now we come to the indian context so where we where do we exist as of now in terms of public health if you want to understand the success story of public health in indian context then we need to understand we need to know that where did we actually stand at the time of independence in 1950s so one of the reports of the government of india published in 1996 
basically elaborated on the important indicators of health existing due around the independence that is late 1940s and early 1950s and the figures are actually surprising you may not be aware of these figures and that is why i am mentioning so that we can we will be in a position to understand the kind of journey that we have already made right you all are aware of the various health indicators existing in contemporary situation but what were those indicators during the 1950s late 40s and early 50s so some of these are like this 50% of the children dead before the age of 5 there was a huge prevalence of infant mortality you cannot imagine as of now primary health care was very rudimentary or non existent and the state of public health was utterly poor as evidenced through life expectancy at birth around 26 so at that point of time life expectancy at birth was only around 26 years it doesn't mean that people were dying at the age of 26 that is this 26 is basically the average life expectancy people some of the people were living up to the age of 70 or 80 also but the point was this that because infant mortality was very high up to 50% of the children were dying that has caused the average that has reduced the average up to the level of 26 infant mortality rate was 162 crude death rate around 22 maternal mortality rate around 20 so this these figures so that the public health conditions were very problematic at that point of time only 4.5% of the population had access to safe water now in this lecture we are also including basically sanitation and water things so you see what was the uh, state of availability of these poor resources 4.5% of the total population had access to safe water and only 2% of the people had sewerage facility you know that for sanitation the sewer facility the sewerage facility is is the backbone without that we cannot think of basically ensuring public health or sanitation so that was the the, the, the that was the situation prevailing uh, almost 70 years back number of medical institutes institutions was few and trained para professionals like nurses midwives sanitary inspectors were barely skeletal in numbers the picture on the nutrition front was very grave food production its distribution and availability of food per capita were all unsatisfactory actually there was huge crisis related to food right so this was the situation almost 70 years back now that we have made several interventions we have the kind of health indicators which we have been discussing last 5 days right so now let us talk about the 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 the, the trajectory of development of public health in india how did we develop the kind of public health system that we have today that is a very massive topic uh, i have delivered several lectures on this and some of those lectures are basically there in youtube also in my channel if anybody interested to know the things at length he or she can basically see those things these are available in open access mode right but here briefly i would like to talk about so before 1947 in 1943 itself a committee was constituted that is known as the bore committee and the basically the mandate for this committee was to suggest measures to develop a very uh, comprehensive health structure in india or a comprehensive public health in india it has made several suggestions right time will not allow us to talk about all these things but primarily it talked about integration of curative and preventive medicine at all levels so we are aware of curative medicine that basically intends to cure from the disease that is also known as a clinical medicine and the preventive medicine that is basically responsible for prevention of occurrence of the disease right preventive part of the healthcare system then this bore committee also suggested that one primary health center 
manned by two doctors, one nurse, four public health nurses, four midwives, four trained dyes, two sanitary inspectors, two health assistants, one pharmacist, and 15 other class four employees for a population of 40,000 should be instituted. And a secondary health center to provide the support to primary health center should be instituted. Right? That means the Bore Committee, long back in 1943, 1940s, basically had suggested this kind of infrastructure. Uh, did we see all these things as after the recommendation made by the Bore Committee? Perhaps no, these things could not get implemented the way these should have been implemented because of the other emerging challenge, challenges in the 50s and the 60s. After independence, basically, government of India kept on constituting several committees. The names of some of these committees I have mentioned. I cannot include the suggestions made by these because time will not allow us for talking about those things. But you can see that there were several, some of these committees and there were several, uh, several other committees which were constituted. Right. Then we talk about another important thing that is some of the disease control program. Basically, the kind of health system that we have today has developed as a result of several specific disease control programs. These were identified as vertical disease control program because these programs were meant for addressing one specific disease, right? For example, the National Malaria Control Program was launched by the government of India in 1953. So this program primarily meant to address the malaria control, right? You need to understand the word control over here, right? So in 1953, we launched National Malaria Control Program, and then it got converted to National Malaria Eradication Program in 1958. So in 53, we tried to control, and in 1958, we tried to eradicate. Unfortunately, we have not been successful in this because malaria as a disease is evolving. The vectors responsible for causation of malaria are evolving. As of today, we are having multi-drug resistant kind of malaria also. The program is operating in some or the other form, right? But this is an important program because mortality caused because of malaria at that point of time was huge. Just like that, National Leprosy Control Program was launched in 1955. You know, leprosy was considered a very uh, stigma type of disease. We are fortunate that we have controlled this program. We have controlled this problem and we have successfully eradicated the problem of leprosy. Then tuberculosis, again, a very serious kind of uh, health threat we had the National Tuberculosis Control Program in 1962. And this program is again running in multiple formats as of today. Then several other programs, National Cancer Control Program, the National Mental Health Program, Kalazar Control Program, and National AIDS Control Program in 1992. Basically, late 80s witnessed the outbreak of AIDS. And that has again created uh, great global concerns. The way we could see the COVID-related concerns last two years, similar type of situation was there because of AIDS. Although the spread was not that massive, but the concern was perhaps just like this or very deeper, right? So these were the specific disease control programs that we witnessed in India. Now, you might have got an idea about public health and the kind of uh, specific interventions started by government of India. There are several programs. Uh, one program that I can uh, mention here is the National Health, uh, National Rural Health Mission, started in 2005. That was a massive program, basically. That National Rural Health Mission created health related infrastructures. It basically made the health infrastructure visible at a rural in the rural areas all over the country. It introduced several new uh, health functionary. You, you all might have heard about ASA. 
that is the accredited social health activist asha right that got institutionalized and then in 1990s basically 1993 we had started the panchayati raj system so this nrhm made the provision of asha and here this panchayati raj system and national rural health mission basically both got club right basically uh, appointment of asha will take place through the panchayat system at the village level so several things basically operated in the background then in 2000 we had the millennium development goals also and then several other things happened right so this is how the the, the millennium development goal basically uh, created the platform for launch of this national rural health mission then it continued up to 2014 and then it made some modification now this nrhm was supposed to add the urban areas also especially the vulnerable the slum population and so from nrhm we moved to nhm that is national health mission and it also included the vulnerable areas that is the slum areas existing in the urban areas right so these programs were there and several other programs were there i think you would be familiar with some of the other programs but we cannot talk about all the programs here so that is the first part of the lecture that is understanding the public health now we come to three specific components which are mentioned in the topic that is sanitation nutrition and safe drinking water so what is the state of sanitation as well? sanitation is something that you all have been hearing about but what do we mean by sanitation sanitizers the term sanitizer became very popular during covid perhaps never before we had been talking about sanitizer right then sanitary napkin something that is very important and uh, some of the participant talked about the menstruation cycle and use of the sanitary napkins so we talk about sanitary napkins we talk about sanitizer we talk about sanitation but what do we understand by this right these are not the same concept these are closely related concepts or independent concepts also right but we will talk about sanitation again we will take support from the definition given by world health organization the definition of sanitation given by world health organization states that sanitation refers to the provision of facilities and services for the safe disposal of human urine and feces feces means what the the human excreta right that we go and deliver in the toilets every day right so the safe disposal of the human urine and the feces the who also adds that adds that sanitation also refers to the maintenance of hygienic condition through services such as garbage collection and waste water disposal so think of your, our day to day life right just think of our day to day life from morning to evening how do we live we all go to the washroom the bathroom toilets right and there we excrete the urine and the feces what happens to that during the earlier time basically people used to go to the fields open fields and that is known as open defecation but as of today in the urban living basically we all have toilets in our households so what happens to the feces that we dispose on day to day basis is there a mechanism of safe disposal is there a mechanism of making that disposal process hygienic and healthy so sanitation talks about that that because we all know that that the those human feces basically have several bacteria and that is basically responsible for causation of several diseases problems like diarrhea or cholera were related with these things right so this is basically how world health organization has defined sanitation then there is one important contributor very important contributor dr bindeshwar pathak you all might have heard of sulabh saucharle he is the founder of sulabh saucharle and sulabh international social service organization so dr bindeshwar pathak who visioned the concept of toilets public toilets primarily he talks about sanitation according to him sanitation includes 
water supply, safe disposal of human waste, waste water and solid waste management, control of vectors of disease, domestic and personal hygiene, food and housing, right? He includes basically all these components which are related to the disposal of the human faces and the treatment related to that. Uh, I have also authored a book on sociology of sanitation, right? And that book has been recommended by some of the uh, uh, universities and basically other agencies as a basic textbook also. And there I've given a work, one very comprehensive definition, right? So what does I say there? Akram in his book, Sociology of Sanitation says that sanitation refers to adopting the principles, practices, provisions, or services. So we have to accept all these things, the principles, the practices, the provisions, and the services related to cleanliness and hygiene in personal and public life. So it is not just about accepting these things in the personal domain only, personal as well as public life, in such ways that one enjoys the beneficial impact on physical, mental, moral, and spiritual well-being at personal as well as community levels and ensures that no one else get adversely affected directly or indirectly by the negative impact of human excreta, household waste, garbage, and other pollutants. So what did I add in this definition? I added this component that no one else should get adversely affected because, because there was a provision of basically traditional toilets in the households till 30, 40 years back. And people were defecating in a bucket. And those bucket full of the human feces were basically carried by the specific community known as manual scavengers. Now that scavenging practice was basically very dehumanizing. Because when people defecate in their household, then that material is basically carried by some other human beings. So here the dignity of the others are getting adversely affected. Of course, their health is also getting affected adversely. That means we need to have an arrangement where, where nobody, no one else should get adversely affected. That means it should be systematic, it should be scientific, it should be based on rational infrastructure. And that is how basically we are having the modern toilets. However, even in the modern toilets, the, 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 the feces which are collected, these needs to be transported to a specific area where there should be a proper scientific arrangement of waste management. And just like that, the wastewater that is getting, getting collected in every household every day, how do we think of basically uh, making an improvement on that? That needs a scientific discourse. So sanitation talks about not only the hygiene, but also a scientific treatment of the waste basically created on day-to-day -day basis. So that is the larger definition of sanitation. Now, someone asked, why do we need to talk about sanitation? Or what is the impact of sanitation on health or public health? So this is tremendous. Lack of sanitation or insanitation is responsible for causes and the spread of several disease and illness conditions. This is caused by germs and worms in feces, waste and pollutants are causing discomfort for millions of people. So there are in number of uh, someone needs to mute himself or herself. Please mute because there is a disturbance. So there are n number of diseases caused because of those untreated feces, urine, or the waste, right? A study conducted by World Bank's South Asia Water and Sanitation Unit estimated that estimated that India loses rupees 240 billion annually. India loses rupees 240 billion annually due to lack of proper sanitation facility. So when we do not have proper sanitation facility, that causes a huge economic burden. 
you may think that how is that basically possible because because due to this type of insanitation there is a spread of communicable disease and all the economic cost related to that communicable disease is basically caused because of this type of lack of sanitation poor sanitation affects the economic development social development and human development of the nation women children poor and vulnerable groups are most affected by the hazards of lack of proper sanitation and according to the ministry of health and family welfare more than rupees 20 billion is spent every year on poor sanitation and its resultant illnesses that means if there is poor sanitation then it may have compounding impact on the health and public health and during covid basically we saw that everybody started talking about sanitation that uh, washing your hands three times six times 10 times a day using a soap what is this that is basically sanitation taking bath regularly and scientifically what is that that is sanitation right so this is sanitation and then uh, the present government basically took several steps to build toilets we all are aware of the the, the initiatives taken by the present central government to build toilets to provide the households with the scientific toilets because unless we have those scientifically built toilets we cannot scientifically address the problem so having toilets in every household and then making use of those toilets that is a big challenge so india is trying to address the problems related to open defecation in very significant way i have written several papers on this anybody interested basically can explore the internet and find those papers there are other people also who have written a lot on these things so this is something related to sanitation uh, there are several other things that i need to address so i won't Uh, remain stuck to this but yes we have a specific data on that india human development report of 2011 has stated that 50% of the households have no toilets based on the nss data of 65th round right we talked about nso yesterday also as a source of data right so the nso data 65th round does talk about the prevalence of or availability of toilets and way back in 2011 almost 50% households were not having any toilet right and then when the toilets are not there then people will go for open defecation so open defecation in india remains a major challenge right then the 69th round data of nss covered the time period from july 2012 to december 2012 and published the data in 2013 and stated that the 59.4% and 8.8% households in rural india and urban india respectively had no latrine facility so what will happen in a country where such a massive number of rural as well as urban people do not have latrines open defecation will become the natural response right that is why the government is making best efforts to address the related things right the data shows that 62.3% and 16.7% of the households in rural india and urban india respectively did not have any bathroom facility now going beyond the toilets we need to talk about the bathrooms the places where we take bath because that is a private space we take bath not in public but privately and what is the availability of the bathrooms these figures talk about that and that is also taken from the nss data so these are all very important figures so that is the condition related to sanitation now uh, i have talked about some of the important attributes of sanitation because sometimes people think that sanitation is like uh, cleanliness only or like purity only in indian culture basically there are concepts of purity and pollution pavitra and apavitra etc so basically sanitation is not like uh, purity and pollution or it's not like uh, pavitra or apavitra 
Sanitation is a scientific discourse. We need to understand sanitation in a scientific way, right? So anybody interested can go through these attributes. These will help you to understand sanitation in a larger context. Now we come to another important component of today's lecture, and that is nutrition. We have been talking about nutrition since our lecture first, right? We all are aware of the presence of micro and macro nutrients in our food, which are necessary for the survival of our uh, body and our life, right? So we all are aware of that. What are the essentials micronutrients for all of us? For example, we talk about carbohydrate, protein, or for that matter, fat also sometimes. Then we talk about the presence of calcium, magnesium, and several other components. We all are aware of the vitamins, the several types of vitamins, etc. Right? The, the, the absence of a small quantity of a specific component, for example, sodium, can create a severe disease. Right? The, 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 the absence of iodine, <coughs> That was basically creating a disease like goiter. And that is why the concept emerged, uh, that the concept of iodized salt emerged, right? So we need to take these nutrients very seriously. The absence of any specific nutrient can create huge burden. Now, so nutrition is very important. You, you all are uh, conceptually aware of this. I wanted to share some of the figures basically related to prevalence of nutrition in the Indian states. So this is very important figure. There are four or five slides taken from the NFHS4 data. Percentage prevalence of non-breastfeeding children aged 6 to 23 months receiving an adequate diet. Right. That means we are talking about the children who are there in the age of six months to 23 months, because up to six months, children basically depend on the mother feeding, but after six months, they need some external diet also. So from six months to 23rd month, that means before reaching to the age of two years, right? Now, what is the prevalence? And there are very disturbing figures. Some of the best performing and worst performing states are there. You see, states like Gujarat, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Jharkhand, Uttarakhand, Chhattisgarh, Bihar, they are all performing very poor. They are all performing very poor, right? In addressing or in providing adequate diet to the non-breastfeeding children. Now, this is a serious cultural issue. This is a serious social issue. It's not about availability because across the economic groups, the problem is prevailing. Across the educated community, the problem is prevailing. Across the caste domains, the problem is prevailing. Because when you see that only 10% or below 10% of the population is providing adequate nutrition, that means the problem is massive. And the best performing states like Tamil Nadu, Jammu and Kashmir, West Bengal, and Kerala, right? Even there, this is not around 90% or 80%. It is remaining below 50%, even in these domains. And then can you see, and then you can see the disparity between urban and rural. There is a huge disparity visible almost in all the states in the rural and urban spaces also. That means we are not in a position to provide adequate diet to the non-breastfeeding children. Now, what will be the consequence of that? We will see in next few slides. And uh, I mean, those figures are disturbing. Some of you really, really would be surprised to know that. Now, this next figure, Percentage prevalence of total children aged 6 to 23 months receiving an adequate diet. Now, we have not categorized here breastfeeding or non breastfeeding, right? Basically, it talks about an aggregate figure. Total children aged 6 to 23 months, right? And even here, the figures are equally disturbing. You can see the, dis the, the disparity. I will share the slides with you as we have been sharing, and you can see 
the situation prevailing in several states. We will come to this slide. Now, this is something that some of you may not be familiar with. Stunting is a phenomenon, right? I don't know how many among you is aware of when height is seen in terms of age. That means when the age is progressing, but the height is not progressing, then this is known as stunting, right? And you can see the spread of stunting in Indian states. Unfortunately, there are states like Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Gujarat, where stunting as a phenomenon is a massive. Almost 40% of the people or the children basically are witnessing this stunting kind of thing. That means their height is not growing along with their age. And the best performing states like Kerala, Goa, Tripura, Punjab, all also having almost 20% or around population or children who are having this type of problem. Now, this is a serious implication of malnourishment. This is not the only implication. This is one of the very serious implications. Then let us go to the next one. That is a weight for height. Now, this is known as a wasting. That means whatever height is increasing, the proportionately weight is not increasing. Now, this phenomenon is known as basically wasting. And you can see again, even in terms of wasting, you can see the performance of the states. Again, Jharkhand, Gujarat, Karnatak, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh are performing very poorly. These states are having the phenomenon of wasting up to 25% or like that. Now, you can see there is a basically double deposition here. Many are not having the height as per their age. And whatever height they have attained, they are not having the corresponding weight. Right? That means the age is increasing, the height is not increasing. And whatever height has increased, then they are not having the due weight related to that. And when there is basically discrepancy in the height and weight, or weight and age, that means that is a serious, very serious indication of malnutrition prevent, right? Because we have, I have given you a description of the states and made a comparison also between NF, NFHS 3 and NFHS 4. Uh, anybody interested can go through these slides and reach to some very important conclusion. Then we come to underweight, basically. And that is prevailing under the age group of five years. That means affecting the children. So almost 40% in the worst performing state children are underweight. And that the problem is existing up to 10 to 15% or 20% also in some of the best states. So this is reflecting upon the kind of inequality and disparity which is existing among the states between the rural and the urban population and over a period of time, and very surprisingly, the massiveness of the problem, the magnitude of the problem. Then we come to a larger age groups. You may think that we are talking about only the children. So let us talk about women, the body mass index, BMI. I think all of you are familiar with the notion of BMI. Now, let us see what kind of prevalence of this is existing. What percentage of women are having basically the BMI less than the standard? And again, you can see the Jharkhand, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh are having very poor performance in BMI, right? Almost 30%. And here you can see some important additional figures also. We are having the NFHS four figures and also the NFHS three figures, all placed in one uh, chart, right? There is a huge disparity between rural and urban areas in percentage prevalence of BMI in many states like Jharkhand, rural is 35.4 and urban is 21.6. Madhya Pradesh, rural is 31.8, urban is 20.6. Gujarat, rural is 34.3, urban is 18. Right? Now, what do you think of basically the reproductive health when the BMI is so low? 
how can we ensure because that is the basically 18 to 21 to 23 24 are official or unofficial numbers for the age of getting married and attaining motherhood right then we come to another important figure talking about basically men you should not all the boys and men should not remain under the impression that that the problem is prevailing only among females we have a gendered perspective on most of the issues even the men there is a significant percentage which is basically having poor, poor bmi right you can see the prevalence in the different states then we come to very important component children age 6 to 59 months who are anemic now anemia right almost 70% children are anemic now what are you talking about the public health concerns when the majority of the children are basically anemic that is a clear cut indication of the level of nutrition or malnutrition prevailing in the country now here i would like to add one more concept when you talk about malnutrition you need to understand that malnutrition is not only related with undernutrition and overnutrition can also be identified as malnutrition rather it is because when you consume some of the nutrients in an overdose kind of thing then definitely some other nutrients are becoming deficient so whether that is an undernutrition or that is an overnutrition because obesity is again a problem right so if you happen to see some of the fat boys and girls around you you need to understand that they are all malnourished it's not about the skinny thin people only it's also about the fat people because nutrition means a balanced scientifically uh recommended kind of intake of the various components of the food right so there is a problem related to undernutrition there is a problem related to overnutrition all getting reflected in malnutrition and all and anemia is basically one of the indicators of the prevalence of this problem then we come to pregnant women pregnant women in the age of 15 to 49 years pregnant women basically this is basically the beginning of the birth cycle when women become pregnant they conceive babies and those babies basically take birth a malnourished mother will give birth to a malnourished child a women who is suffering from some kind of illness basically she will give birth to a child who is having the possibility of the probability of getting affected by some of those diseases and this probability is very high and that is why it is recommended that that we need to ensure that the pregnant women should not remain malnourished the government basically provides several sources of nutrition during the antenatal care we all are aware of the concept of uh, anganwadis and the anms who provide some kind of nutritious staple food to women but the problem is basically massive right so this is how we can see the prevalence of these problem the, the, the prevalence of these types of serious complications now we come to the last component of this lecture that is safe drinking water unfortunately even on this component we are not performing very well globally at least 2 billion people use a drinking water source contaminated with feces that is why we were talking about sanitation when 2 billion water when 2 billion people are drinking water where the source is contaminated by the feces then that is basically the side that the disease cycle 
Microbial contamination of drinking water as a result of contamination with feces poses the greatest risk to drinking water safety. While the most important chemical risk in drinking water arise from arsenic, fluoride, or nitrate, emerging contamina contaminants such as a pharmaceuticals, pesticides, per and polyfluoroalkyl substance, and microplastic gen generate public health concern. We can see the impact of the pesticides and several other chemicals, the chemical agents, the pollutants, basically the carcinogenic elements, all these things contaminate the water. And so the availability of safe drinking water, portable water is a serious concern, right? Globally. Now we come to the Indian scenario safe drinking water in India, it is estimated that waterborne diseases have an economic burden of approximately US dollar 600 million a year in India. This is especially true for drought and flood prone areas, which affected a third of India's population in past couple of years. Then two third of India's 718 districts are affected by extreme water depletion. Now this is a new problem which is emerging. Water contamination is a one set of problem and water depletion is another set of problem and that is more serious. Water depletion means basically when you go for a boring well kind of thing, then the water layer is getting down and down and down to the extent that in certain areas, this water layer is almost vanishing. Now that is a great climatic challenge. It is not something which is related to only our day-to-day -day life, but that is also related to the overall macro life, the climatic condition, because the floods are becoming more regular. The droughts are at the same time becoming more regular. That means we need to look at the problem of availability of safe drinking water, not only in the perspective, not only at the micro level level, micro level perspective, but also at the macro and the global perspective. And that is why we are having massive discussion and discourses on climate change, right? These are the adverse impacts of climate change. Then this water basically is becoming uh, polluted because of the uh, disposal of the waste to the rivers. Now rivers are important sources of water. When we basically drop the industrial waste in the water or the flowing rivers, then the entire ecosystem is getting polluted, right? So there are uh, very important concerns related to safe drinking water. This, the impact of pollutants on water is basically killing and unfortunately the vulnerable population, that is the children and the pregnant women and the elderly people, basically they become worst victim of this, right? So this is how we try to understand the state of public health in India, on the one side, we have achieved great amount of success in controlling some of the disease. But on the other hand, the public health scenario is not very good. We need to move fast on these uh, specific measures or on, on these identified denominators. If we are unable to address these things, then perhaps the goal of achieving health for all will remain unaddressed. So thank you very much for being with me. Uh, now we will go for a group photography, right? So uh, one minute time I will take and first we will go for the group photography. Sure, sir. I request all of you to keep your your video on for one minute. If anybody interested can take the group photograph and here at the conference hall, we'll take the group photograph. I request all of you to remain, to keep your videos on for next two minutes so that we'll take a sufficient number of photographs.
So yeah, I think keep your video on. All of you, please keep your video on. Sir, actually, I'm having some problem with my oh. camera. No, no issue, no issue. I call of. The corona. Of course, I was. Yeah, okay. So we'll take one by one. There are multiple screens here. We'll take one by one, right? So please remain here. Some of the participants are Yet do not open their video. So now this part is, we have completed the photograph part. Basically, we are supposed to ensure the photographs of all the candidates, participants every day, but uh, we could not uh, maintain that, unfortunately. So now we have delivered the first lecture and after one minute or two minutes, we'll start the second lecture. I will uh, request all the participants, uh, all the participants to keep their questions ready for discussion during the tutorials. And today we will have many other presentations by the participants, right? Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to share with you all that, that today we will close the lecture. We, today we will complete the lecture and tutorial series. Uh, we are really very happy that the participants have joined very enthusiastically and uh, at least 80% of the participants remain very regular in all the lectures and tutorials. Uh, 10 to 15% participants, uh, I don't know what kind of problem they are having, but yes. So just two minutes break and then we will one more picture.
we are we are quite used to for the offline things always ready with a great a smile when we were offline now having a smiles and then uh, remaining technically ready right is a big challenge Is it done? Doctor Iram is not visible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is it over? I hope some of you have also taken the screenshots. Yeah. Okay. Done. So now, uh, Dr. Swalihin may like to address the gathering for uh, just to conclude this session, right? Formally, and then we will start this uh, second lecture in two three minutes. Well, uh, it was a wonderful lecture, sir that you have enlightened us on the issues of public health and taken into consideration the different dimensions of public health. And uh, then we have discussed the sanitation. We have never thought of sanitation in that way to discuss sanitation as a science and an art. And just looking into the impact of, impact of uh, worse sanitation on uh, the potable water and some sort of, uh, some sort that's become an important issue of public health. So I'm just uh, briefly uh, just concluding what we have discussed today. So we, we discussed first the public health and WHO has given the multifaceted and multidimensional definition of public health. Taken into consideration the different dimension, WHO has defined public health as a science and art of preventing disease, prolonged life, promoting mental and physical health, and efficiency through organized community efforts for the sanitation of the environment, the control of communicable infection, the education of individuals, personal hygiene, the organization of medical and nursing services for early diagnosis and prevention diseases. So if we look into the WHO definition of public health, it's, it, it is actually including the different dimensions, right? And uh, there is a difference between the public health and the community health. Public health in itself is a discipline, is a science. It is, a, it, it is the art of applicability of the scientific ethics to look into the different dimensions and community health can be a part of the public health. And uh, the Almata Declaration of 1978 really uh, declared that health for, for all, primary health care as the key to the attainment of the goal for health for all. And then coming, uh, coming off uh, millennium development goals that actually being, if, uh, if um, you know, last till 2015 and then sub sustainable development goals. And uh, under this uh, heading of public health, we have a detailed discussion on sanitation. And WHO literally has, has given a very uh, important comprehensive definition of sanitation, that it refers to the provision of facilities and services for safe disposal of human urine and feces. It also refers to the maintenance of hygienic condition through services such as garbage collection and uh, wastewater disposal. And uh, Akram sir, in his book, already talk of the sanitation and taking the other dimension as well, that it is the, uh, you know, adopting the principle, some, something that we need to develop the values when we just talking of the sanitation uh, the, and that value can be reflected in the principles, in the practices, in the provision services related to the cleanliness and hygiene in person and public health. He added an important dimension while defining the sanitation that health cannot be achieved, right? If we not looking into that, how it is, uh, you know, uh, adversely affecting um, the others and sanitation and what is actually focusing on such type of issues. And um, he also talked of that why we need to have the sanitation, right? So sanitation literally having the significant impact on the acquisition and the spread of the several diseases. Poor sanitation affects the economic, de economic development and other social development issues. 
and it's also leads to these uh, spread of germs and vector bone disease and at the latter part of the discussion he discussed about the nutrition and under the nutrition head he discussed that stunted wasted and underweight uh, literally is an important issue and uh, he has taken into consideration the analysis of the different rounds of an NFHS National Family Health Survey and discuss that how the disparities in the different states in terms of the stunted, which is height for age, wasted, which is weight for height, and underweight, which is weight for age, is literally an important issue. And and, and some of the developed state of the country literally having uh, having high stunted ratio, right? And that is literally astonishing me that the Gujarat and Punjab literally having a high rate of stunted and wasted. Right, but Kerala is literally doing uh, is having a very good indicator in, lit in relation to IM, uh, either in relation to IMR, MMR, and even in relation to the stunted, wasted, and underweight issues of nutrition. And uh, he also discussed that uh, the, the worst BMI of women literally having some adverse impact on the uh, reproductive uh, health of the women. And uh, at, at last, he also talked of the safe drinking water. Safe drinking water is literally an important issue for the health. Potable water for public health is important. And he also talked of the sanitation has significant effect on drinking water. So we, we literally come on this analytical part of the discussion that Sanitation is important because uh, sanitation literally having some sort of uh, impact on the drinking water as well. And uh, some waterborne disease, which is an important uh, issue of the public health, also uh, having some uh, you know, relation to the sanitation. And then uh, water depletion is a severe problem. And we all are facing that the water is depleting day by day. And there are multiple causes of the water depletion. So this is uh, literally from my side that I can conclude, sir. And it was enlightening and a detailed discussion on uh, the different issues of public health, but all the issues are somewhat interrelated to each other. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Swalehi, for uh, adding your own remarks and uh, concluding the major discussions that we carried out. Now we move to the next lecture. And this is again a very interesting lecture. Uh, I'll request Abhibhai to share the screen for the next lecture. <coughs> Well, So welcome again to this 12th lecture delivered by uh, host faculty and course coordinator, me, Professor Muhammad Akram from Department of Sociology, Aliyah Muslim University. Now we have seen basically the prevailing conditions in Indian context, as well as in global context. Now one of the most powerful intervention or tool of intervention is the basically national policy. We all know that policies are basically documents which give a vision, which give the future direction of action, and basically which propose a very time-bound kind of outcome or result, right? So in every democratic country, we have a specific policies. Then we also have the specific plans, there's a difference between policy and plan. Policy are the basically guidelines, the directions, and plans are basically the workable models 
where the budget is also included and a specific time period is also included. And that is why policies basically keep their relevance for a longer period of time. Every policy becomes a very important document, not only for the future, but also it remains a reference point for the past. Uh, in our department, uh, I'm teaching one of the papers that is social policy and planning. And there we discuss very important component of the policies. Policies do have their own principles. They do have their own values. They do have their own specific sources. Now, when we look at the sources of social policy, then definitely the constitution of that particular country is a very important source. So in Indian context, no matter which policy we are talking about, but invariably we are linked with the constitution. But basically the constitution is giving you the values, the guidelines, then we have the parliament basically, and the parliament or the legislative assemblies are the policy making bodies. Why do we have a parliament? When we say central government, then we have the parliament, basically MPs, and at the state level, we have the state legislature, that is the MLAs. So what is the job of those MPs and the MLAs? Their job is to basically formulate the policy, approve the policy, right? So this is the larger phenomenon. In a democratic country, basically democratically elected representatives play the most important role in developing the policies. So that was a brief discussion on policy so that you must know what is it that we are talking about. These are the policies. Then we have policies in a specific domains. Basically, we have the economic policies and we have the social policy, right? Now, we have health policies. And in this lecture, we'll talk about the health policy. Along with that, we will also talk about medical pluralism. Right, because there are different systems of medicine globally. The Western model or the allopathic system of medicine is definitely the dominant discourse as of now. After the uh, invention of antibiotics, basically allopathic system of medicine became very popular because it has a huge impact on controlling some of those diseases causing vectors, right? But there are other systems of medicine also often identified as alternative system of medicine or supplementary system of medicine or indigenous system of medicine, right? We will talk about those things in the later part of the discussion when we will take up the topic medical pluralism in India. So this lecture I've divided in five sections, national health policy 1983, national health policy 2002 and national health policy 2017. The 2017 policy is the current policy. We talked about, we referred to this policy when we were talking about universal health coverage. And then we will also talk about the concept of medical pluralism and medical pluralism in India. Now, first health policy, 1983. Basically, it is surprising for me, and it may become surprising for many among you, that we had the first health policy as late as in 1983. India became independent, 47, we adopted the constitution, 1950. We had a population policy in 1950, but unfortunately, we could have our first health policy as late as in 1983. I've shared some of the important things related to this in this slide. You will see the slide and find out the important facts mentioned over there. I would like to talk about a few things which I could not include in these slides, right? Uh, I have prepared several uh, uh, video lectures which are also uploaded in my YouTube channel. Anybody interested in getting, uh, in going through the details of these policies can go through those lectures also, but I will try to create a continuity here among all these policies. So the, this we need to see this 1983 policy in the backdrop of the Alma Atta Declaration of 1978 of World Health Organization. In 1978, WHO stated that health for all is a universal goal. Now that was a very important basically intervention because health has always been a priority. But unfortunately, the kind of political economic system that we had been witnessing 
historically that healthcare was not available or accessible to the majority of the people or the masses. It remained a kind of uh, uh, resource for the rich or the elites on, right? So this concept of health for all is a very important because cutting across the boundaries, it talks about health for all and it instructed the nation states to make appropriate policies for that. And so in that backdrop, the national health policy 1983 came into existence. It tried to address several important components. It tried to address how can we think of achieving the target of health for all by 2000. So this policy document is talking about that. Then there were other important developments in the 1980s and 1990s. Basically the decade of 1990s is very important in Indian context because we witnessed a massive change in the economy and polity in the 1990s. Changes were simultaneously occurring in the political domain as well as in the economic domain. We witnessed change of several governments in the early, the first half of the 1990s. We had several political developments there. We will not talk about those things here, but you all may have an idea about that, right? Because of globalization and liberalization, there were major policy shifts also in the first half of the 90s, right? So you might be aware of Manmohan Singh as prime minister and before that, Manmohan Singh as the finance minister, right? Basically, when India went for this globalization, liberalization and, private, and privatization, that at that point of time, the economic policies changed very dramatically. And because of those changes in the economic policies, the social policies also changed very significantly. And a reflection of that was also in the health policies. So these were some of the development which were related to the political uh, uh, domain at that point of time. But simultaneously, there were other development also. We talked about human development. In the 90s, human development index became a very important parameter of development at a global level, right? And India had to respond to that also. We discussed yesterday that in the decade of 1990s, we started with National Family Health Survey. So we had plenty of baseline data related to that. Then in the late 80s, basically there was uh, AIDS. Uh, so there was a focus on STDs, that is sexually transmissible disease and AIDS. So all those developments actually influenced a lot the domestic environment. And as a consequence of that, we had the next health policy, that is the National Health Policy 2002. There, is, there was one important development also, in terms of the Millennium Development Goal. In 2000, we had the MDGs, Millennium Development Goal, and it envisaged eight different goals. And out of those eight goals, four or five were directly related to the health issues, like infant mortality, communicable disease, control over the maternal mortality, control over the spread of AIDS and communicable disease, then uh, hunger, addressing the problem of hunger, poverty, sustainable development, literally all these goals were related with health, including education also. So in this backdrop, basically this National Health Policy 2002 came into existence. It did talk about some of the very important things. The policy uh, reflects the prioritization of human development effort. Most important thing is this, that the 2002 policy focuses on the human development approach. It also reflects the large scale macro and structural changes which took place in Indian economy and polity because of our exposure to the trial of liberalization, privatization and globalization. Then again, it talks about making health access or healthcare access equitable. That means accessible to all sections of the society. Then it also talks about setting up a well-dispersed network of comprehensive primary health care service. We talked about this earlier also. A very comprehensive system of visible, viable system of primary health care. 
because till now we have understood that we cannot achieve the targets related to health indicators or health outcome without ensuring the functioning of a robust primary health care system. And so the NRHN that we just talked about in the previous class, basically that was a product of this national health policy 2002, right? So there were several important measures introduced in the national health policy 2002. It also talked about increasing the allocation, right? It recommended to increase health sector expenditure to 6% of GDP, with 2% of GDP being contributed as public health investment by the year 2010. So national health policy 2002 will be remembered for its uh, aspiration to allocate up to 6% of GDP. That was almost parallel to the health expenditure in most of the developed countries or states. Unfortunately, that could not become a reality. However, this goal was very important. An increased allocation of 55% of the total public health investment for the primary health sector. Now, when we, we, when we talk about basically investing a specific amount, then what kind of allocation will be there? So this health policy 2002 stated that 50% of the health budget allocation will be for the primary health care and the rest will be for the secondary and the tertiary, right? 35% for the secondary and 10% for the tertiary because tertiary care basically needs huge investment, huge cost and higher uh, specialty related hospitals. So, the government said that, that we will focus a lot on primary health care, right? And that is why you can see that there is a massive uh, network of primary health centers, sub-centers, then basically the community health centers, et cetera, remaining available at the village level and block level, right? Even at the district level, you can see the district referral centers, right? So these, are, these were the things which were envisioned and uh, that kind of structure basically developed. Then this policy also talked about basically uh, inclusion of the vertical disease control programs within the framework of the national health system, right? Then we come to the contemporary policy that is the 2017 national health policy. Now, again, there is a background related to this. In 2015, we have the SDGs, that is the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals basically talk about where various new dimensions related to health. So this policy has tried to address some of the issues raised in the Sustainable Development Goal. And then there is another important thing that this national health policy basically came in a new regime, a new political regime. And it included several new dimensions. So let us talk about some of these dimensions. The policy document states, now 14 years after the last health policy, the context has changed in four major ways. This 2017 policy categorically says that the context has changed now. What context we had in 2002 is different from what context that we have in 2017. Now, what are those news areas? What are those new areas which were identified? First, health priorities are changing. Although maternal and child mortality have rapidly declined, there is growing burden on account of non-communicable disease and some infectious diseases. So earlier we were focusing on the communicable disease. We can see that all the vertical disease control program somehow tried to address the issues related to the communicable disease. We focused a lot on maternal health, reproductive health in the decade of 1990s and 2010. But now that we need to focus on non-communicable disease also. The second important thing is the emergence of a robust healthcare industry. By now, we are already having a robust that is a viable healthcare industry. When we are talking about healthcare industry, that means we are talking about not only the government machinery, but also the private machinery, right? The corporate system, the private industry, the private clinics, 
hospital system, etc. That means the burden on the government <coughs> hospital could be lessened and the corporate hospitals, private hospitals could be included for achieving the goals of ensuring health for all, right? That is the second important priority. Then the third change is the growing incidence of catastrophic expenditure due to healthcare cost. Now, when we are already having the, 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 the corporate hospital in a viable mode, then what has happened? We have seen in the earlier lectures that the, the cost of healthcare has increased. So this policy takes into consideration this, that there is a catastrophic expenditure due to healthcare cost, and we need to address this by including some of the insurance or assurance models. So we will talk about these things also. And the fourth point is a rising economic growth enables enhanced fiscal capacity. That Indian economy is growing fast, and because of the growth in the economy, we can go for inclusion of several other uh, fiscal measures or fiscal capacities, something that the economics people can understand better. So this new health policy or the national health policy is basically responding to these four newly defined contexts. Now there are several measures. This is a very long policy document. It will not be possible for us to address all the provisions related to that. But I want to share the core component so that you're gonna get a first-hand information about the core important priorities. And then if interested, you can get into the details by seeing the policy document itself, right? The primary aim of the National Health Policy 2017 is to inform, is to inform, clarify, strengthen and prioritize the role of the government in shaping health system in all its dynamics. It says categorically that the priority of the government is changing and now the government needs to clarify that what are the priorities at the national level and how can we address those things. So it talks about eight, nine important points. What are those eight, nine important points? First is investment in health. Who will make the investment? Should the government continue to invest or the government should also include the other parties, basically the private sector to make an investment because the private sector had already started making huge investments in health sector, right? So investments in health as important priority. Then organization of healthcare services. Basically, we all are familiar with the kind of healthcare services available in our surrounding, the primary healthcare system, the secondary, the district hospital, the referral system, and then the medical colleges and all those things. So because there is an expansion in the structure, we need to organize that in such a way that we can provide the best, the optimum level of the things. And simultaneously, I, I, I would also like to add here, we will talk about this in the later section, that is the medical pluralism part, but there are other systems of medicine other than the allopathic system of medicine. For example, the Ayurvedic system of medicine or the Yunani system of medicine or the homeopathic system of medicine. So how can we develop a new equilibrium at organizational level among all these systems of medicine? That was an important priority. Then prevention of disease and promotion of good health through cross-sectoral actions. Then access to technologies. You all remember that after 1990s, basically the ICT is witnessing a rapid growth in India and world over. So how can we make use of this access to technology? Now, many agencies are basically having the track record of the patients. Most of the renowned hospitals have already started ICT based registration system. So how can we develop more access by making use of technology. This is a new concern. Then developing human resources. Basically, human beings are having the potential to become human resource, but they are not human resource on their own. We need to make appropriate intervention, appropriate investment on human beings. And ensuring good health is certainly one of the biggest investment along with education. So developing human resources and not only talking about people as human resources,
but also need to talk about the service provider, basically the care provider. We need to have more professionals who can provide these services. Professionals not only in one specific area, but in multiple areas, because now there are new technologies. So just to support those new technology, we need to train new human resources, right? That means the dimensions related to the health provider is getting widened. Now we are having new type of tests. We were not familiar with MRI kind of things 20 years back. But as of today, MRI has become a very uh, local phenomenon. Every locality is having one MRI center. How do we get the technicians trained for that? There are several hospitals where we were having the instruments related to MRI or for that matter, several other instruments, but we were not having the trained manpower who can handle these things, right? So there is a need to focus on that also. That is what is meant by human resource. And then encouraging medical pluralism. Yes, we all know that the medical pluralism has been encouraged. As of today, we can see that there are uh, primary health centers where we have people who are trained not only in the allopathic system of medicine, but also in some of the uh, IUS related systems of medicine, right? Then building knowledge base, of course, knowledge base is required because all these considerations could not be in could not be addressed without having a proper information, baseline information, right? Then developing better financial protection strategies, something we talked about in universal health coverage. So financial protection strategies and strengthening regulation and health assurance. Now, regulations are very important, right? Earlier, we stated that many of the uh, private hospitals are going for a huge proportion of cesarean section delivery. Here we need a regulation. <coughs> then if you look at the problem from the perspective of medicine, then we can see that there are several medicines we are having very unregulated pricing. The same salt, the same medicine is available in the market under multiple names and the price may vary up to 10 times. These are the fields where we need a specific government regulation. Then we have several hospital system where the prices are actually uh, unregulated. So all these areas need regulation. So this National Health Policy 2017 has categorically stated that the challenges have increased as of now. So it will be the responsibility of the government to regulate all those discourses which are emerging, right? Or which may emerge. So the national health system should not focus only on providing curative or clinical care, but also focus a lot on these related dimensions. So these were the important concerns which were identified in this National Health Policy 2017. I won't get time to talk about these things at length, but I have tried to address the important issues uh, when I was introducing this policy, right? So these are some of the important things. You can see all these things are there in the health policy. It's a very comprehensive document. Now we come to uh, the next part that is medical pluralism. We have already addressed it that in a, when we have different systems of medicine and when there is a coexistence among those systems of medicine, then this is known as medical pluralism. It has been defined by different people are presented some of these definitions here, you can uh, go through these definitions. Medical pluralism refers to the coexistence of differing medical traditions grounded in different principles or based on different worldviews. Now, this is very important. Whether these different systems of medicines are there, then their principles are there, are different. Their way to look at the problem is different, right? So an allopathic system of medicine is not looking at the problem just like the Ayurvedic system of medicine is looking at. Or for that matter, a Yunani system of medicine is not looking at the problem the way the homeopathic system of medicine is looking at, right? These are all based on different philosophies. But the primary purpose of all these systems of medicine is to provide relief to the patients, relief to the people who are suffering from some or the other element, right? So this is the concept of medical pluralism. Uh, the Western world is largely witnessing one dominant system of medicine, that is the modern allopathic system of medicine. 
but increasingly they are also having the alternative systems of medicine or the supplementary systems of medicine, some of which are indigenous systems of medicine. WHO, that is World Health Organization, has included a specific criteria for identifying which systems of medicine could be identified as alternative or indigenous system of medicine, but time will not allow me to talk about those things, right? So we come straight forward to the Indian situation. Now, in India, we have the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And within this, basically, we have two departments. One that is taking care of the Department of Health and Family Welfare, and the other department is taking care of health research. Right. So one is related to the execution and the implementation part. Another is related to the research part. And then we have a separate Ministry of Ayush. So we have Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Within this, we are having two departments. And then we have a separate ministry, which is Ministry of Ayush. And this Ayush is an acronym. And it stands for Ayurveda, Yoga, Yunani, Siddha, and Homeopathy. These five systems of medicine, which are popular in India. And we have very important apex autonomous institutions. Some of you may not be familiar with these things. Let me talk about these things. These are very important because that will help you to understand what kind of legitimacy these systems of medicine have acquired in Indian context. There is a central council for research in yoga and naturopathy. Then we are having a homeopathic pharmacopoeia laboratory. Then we have a Muraji Desai National Institute of Yoga. Then National Institute of Ayurveda, National Institute of Homeopathy, National Institute of Naturopathy, National Institute of Yunani Medicine, Na then Northeastern Institute of Ayurveda and Homeopathy, and then Northeastern Institute of Folk Medicine. So we have a specific institution of folk medicine also. Sometimes we talk about ethnic medicine or folk medicine, which is popular at the uh, grassroots level communities. These are the different national level apex institution which take into consideration the monitoring, regulation, improvement, research, related priorities of all these things. The point that I want to take from here is this, that these different systems of medicine in India have full recognition and there are central level, high level institutions operating, which are taking into consideration the priorities or the developments over there. Then I have included a few points on these systems of medicine, because some of you may not be familiar with all these things. We cannot have an extended discussion on these things, please. Uh, but just for uh, making you understand what it is talking about, Ayurveda in totality means science of life. It incorporates all aspects of life, whether physical, psychological, spiritual, or social. What is the beneficial and what is harmful to life, what is happy life and what is sorrowful life, all these four questions and life span allied issues are elaborately and emphatically discussed in Ayurveda. Then origin of Ayurveda, yes, it is basically rooted in Indian traditions, Indian civilization, Indian culture. The Vedic texts have scattered references of Ayurveda remedies and allied aspects of medicine and health. Atharva Veda mainly deals with the extensive Ayurveda information. What is the basic philosophy? Uh, I will not be in a position to talk about the basic philosophy because these are all medical sciences. And uh, in some or the other way, talk about some of the specific knowledge, right? That I do not have. So I won't share, I won't discuss about the specific philosophy on which these are based on. But if you have any exposure to any primary uh, source, then you can talk about these things also. Then yoga, yoga is a discipline to improve or develop one's inherent power in a balanced manner. It offers the means to attain complete self-realization. H.K. Bakaru says that the term yoga is derived from the Sanskrit root, which means to join. It signifies the union between individual soul, that is Jivatma, and the universal soul, that is Pramatma. So yoga is yoga and yoga means addition or to join. That means it intends to join the human with the, the supreme body, right? The Jivatma with the Pramatma. 
right? Again, I'm not a practitioner of yoga. I will not be in a position to explain you the philosophy or the specific provisions. But yes, I can tell you some of the working models. The yoga aims at obtaining relief from pain and suffering. Yoga therapy is a specialized form of yogic culture. Yoga therapy refers to the treatment of disease by means of exercises, which may be physical and mental or both. Globally, yoga has acquired great acceptance, great recognition. It gives you an alternative system of medicine and Western world have been identifying India for the kind of contribution it has made in promoting yoga, right? And at, in the simplest words, yoga does talk about several types of exercises and exercises which are necessary for keeping ourselves fit, right? So a healthy lifestyle, yoga basically uh, promotes a healthy lifestyle, not only in terms of physical exercise, but also in terms of consumption of food and several other things. There are several types of yoga, Japa yoga, Karma yoga, Gyan yoga, Bhakti yoga, Raj yoga, Swara yoga, etc. Right? I am assuming that some of you would be familiar with these things. Then Yunani medicine, more than anyone else, it was Hippocrates 406, 460 BC, before Christ, right? Almost 500 years before, who laid the foundation of the Yunani medicine. The Yunani medicine owes its origin as its name suggests to Greece, that is Yunnan. So it originated there and from there it has spread to different parts of the world before the arrival of the Western system of medicine or the allopathic system of medicine. It was one of the most popular system of medicine in India also. It is deep rooted. And as of today, we are having several uh, uh, medical care and research institution based on this system of medicine. In this, uh, in our university, Aligarh Muslim University, there is a very well-known renowned college related to this Yunani medicine. And one of the participants is also coming from this uh, system of Yunani medicine in our group. I think during the tutorial class, she may elaborate more on this or anybody who is familiar with any of these systems except the allopathic system of medicine can elaborate on this. We are having several participants from South India, Tamil Nadu, and basically Siddha system of medicine is a very popular there. I'll expect the participants from Tamil Nadu to explain a little about this Siddha system of medicine. It is one of the oldest system of medicine in India. The term Siddha means achievements and Siddhas were saintly persons who achieved results in medicine. 18 Siddhas were said to have contributed towards the development of this medical system. Siddha literature is in Tamil and it is practiced largely in Tamil speaking part of India and abroad. The Siddha system is largely therapeutic in nature. So this is the Siddha system of medicine is therapeutic in nature, but it is one of the recognized <laughs> system of medicine. As you can see, the Ayush acronym S stands for Siddha, right? It has huge variations. Uh, we will be really delighted if any of the participants coming from Tamil Nadu is explaining at least something related to the Siddha system in the tutorial classes. Then we have homeopathy, something I think in a household name in the northern part of the country at least, but it is also popular in southern uh, state also. When I visited Kerala and I was seeing, I'm going through the primary health system, it was uh, very uh, surprising for me initially, and then very relieving gradually that in their primary health system, they have included the different systems of medicine. And very often it is the choice of the person, or you can say the patient to engage the specific system of medicine. That means when a person is going to a primary health center, it will be his choice to consult uh, an allopathic doctor or say a homeopathic doctor or any other doctor who is available over there. What is this homeopathy? Homeopathy today is a rapidly growing system and is being practiced almost all over the world. In India, it has become a household name due to the safety of its pills and gentleness of its cure. A rough study states that about 10% of the Indian population solely depend on homeopathy for their healthcare needs and is considered as the second most popular system of medicine in the country, 
right so i went to some of the literature and and got this information there are specific institutions related to this homeopathy we can see that that there is a national institute of health affiliated to the university of calcutta and then there are other uh, colleges and institutions also dealing with this homeopathy and then we come to the last part that is a folk medicine as the term folk indicates this is something which is popular at the uh, ethnic level at the community level we are having different types of folk medicine when we basically go for the household treatments everyone is exposed to this milk with a garlic right to relieve from pain what is this this is a household medicine of course it has the ayurvedic component but for that matter every system of medicine is based on some kind of component which is naturally available but the kind of knowledge that we get about the curing impact of garlic right or turmeric these are basically there in our culture almost all of us are aware of the health related benefit of some of the spices especially the garlic the ginger then lots of other spices right these are important components of the folk medicine this is a kind of indigenous knowledge that is developing the tribal communities in india do have their own system of medicine and for that matter every community all over the world had its own system of medicine because before the arrival of the modern system of medicine every community was depending upon these systems of medicine lots of research are going on we all are aware of the the health the health impact of neem right uh, during my childhood basically when we were witnessing the problems related to smallpox then neem was uh, supposed to be one of the most important basically intervention right so when we have these kind of uh, medicine which we receive from our earlier existing generations these are known as the folk medicine these may prevail through the oral traditions now there is an effort to uh, transcribe those oral tradition into written tradition right but these are very important and in several folk medicines in india are basically getting a popularity in foreign countries also abroad also and here we come to the last component that is faith healing india is basically culturally accepting the importance of faith healing all believers world over have some kind of belief in this faith healing right the when we go to doctors with a critical patient then the doctor immediately says that okay we are doing our best now pray to god it irrespective of the religious denominations that we may belong to you may come from any religion but when someone is critically ill then everybody basically takes support from faith healing that is very important right hum log kehte hain ki dua and dawa that means medicines and prayers both work together so faith healing is a very important format very important intervention very often that operates at an instrumental also instrumental level also if you look at the tribal communities i did my phd among the tribals of rajasthan basically south rajasthan and there i found i found that among the bheels and the meenas this faith healing was a very dominant discourse of medicine right so at the level of the tribal communities still there is due importance given to faith healing to what extent these are uh, helpful in giving relief to patients this is a subject of empirical study there are several empirical study which say that that if faith healing is not working alone then it is definitely working when supported by the other systems of medicine so there is dynamics related to that many students basically are interested in exploring these things so this is how we come to the last slide and i think uh, we have consumed the allocated time also um so uh, we discuss several important things in this lecture uh,
we have completed two hours also. Uh, I think that we'll take a half hour break. That is basically a, a technical break also because we have to preserve the recordings and this much time is required uh, to preserve those recordings also. I'm sure that you all are uh, excited today and have your presentations ready. So just wait for half an hour, take some refreshment if you are there uh, in, your in your home and then uh, join us at 12.30. That will be the concluding tutorial session today. We will discuss as many presentations as possible today. We will address all the questions that you may have today. And we will provide you some important instructions also because there are some instructions that I have received from Gyan also. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are closing this meeting as of now. I will request Dr. Swalehin to brief during the tutorial session because as of now, I think we all are uh, saturated. And thank you, thank you very much. Please close the meeting.